The topic of this presentation will be challenges and possible methodologies for musicologists interested in radio art. An experimental acoustic form at the intersection of music, sound art, poetry and drama, radio art was only occasionally subject of musicology studies. When it was, the accent was predominantly given to particular works in tradition with the long-standing musicological and music theory occupation with music compositions. It is also striking that significant number of those analyses focused on works created by composers, thus perhaps indicating that interest for those works came primarily because they represent those composers' achievements in another genre and not for the form itself or specificities of the medium and its artistic potentials. Before proceeding to comment on those valuable contributions, I would address the question, why studying radio art and musicology at all? As my starting point, I will take Gerald Fiebig's essay on acoustic forms in the age of recordability, or more precisely, his argument that the main common characteristic of 20th century and contemporary acoustic forms is their recordability. As three main acoustic forms, he names electroacoustic music, sound art and ars acoustica or acoustic art, also known as radio art. In order to explain how I justify my argument that radio art is a significant topic for musicology, I will briefly comment on Fiebig's argument development. His main concern is with the division of understanding sound art either as music or as gallery-oriented acoustic form, which he argues is a forced choice of reference frame. By introducing radiogenic art as an, quote, artistic form that employ non-musical sound in the form of recorded media or broadcasts, both of which are not usually intended for a gallery situation, end of quote, Fiebig argues that the inclusion of radio art on the basis of quality of recordability helps in going beyond mentioned dualistic perspective between music and sound art. In other words, recordability is seen as the main ontological quality that all three forms share. Further, sound recording is understood as a fundamental techno-historical event. Effects of sound recording were seen or heard not only in the fact that music as art form that existed prior to the act of recording was preserved in this way, but in the idea that whole range of acoustic events could be recorded and manipulated in creative ways. For Fiebig, perspective that introduction of Ars Acoustica brings when discussing sound, art and electroacoustic music is precisely in the fact that listener perceives all three forms through sound recording and or broadcasting, so the recording should be used as main characteristic of all three forms and ontological point of reference. In my work, Fiebig's concept of recordability and notion of the age of recordability, which echoes the title of Walter Benjamin's highly influential essay on art in the age of mechanical reproduction, resonates with the concept of media turn in music, which I am introducing in my PhD dissertation. I use this concept in two ways. First, when referring to the effects of electronic media in terms of technical innovations and the way they are creatively approached to, or when themselves influenced creative responses from composers, artists and musicians. Second, I see media turn as the change in thinking about media and music in various music studies and especially musicology. By this, I have in mind growing a corpus of literature on music in which there is call to discuss technological and material conditions in which certain artistic outputs are produced and received. Those conditions are not simply given to be used and lived through in one particular way, but, on the contrary, continually performed and socially mediated. In that sense, meaning of particular music practice, or more broadly, acoustic art practices, is created, performed and mediated in the networks of human and non-human actors. Thus, in order to understand these complex processes, 
musicologists interested in more detailed historical account on various acoustic forms created in the wake of media turn or in the age of recordability has to employ more detailed analysis than the one concerned predominantly with the concept of work. Here I find comments brought by anthropologist Georgina Born on Lydia Goerz's study on concept of musical work especially useful, following on Goerz's statement that, quote, there is nothing about the concept of a work, the relations between works and performances, or works and scores, or works and experiences of them that is going to tell us where the locus of musical meaning really resides, end of quote. Born comments that Goerg, quote, seems to recognize that there is no single privileged location of musical meaning, but that it may be distributed across and configured by the relations between its several mediations, end of quote. Born goes on to develop theory of mediation in music and she introduces the concept of musical assemblage defined as quote particular combination of mediations sonic discursive visual artifactual technological social temporal characteristic of a certain musical culture and historical period end of quote given her position in sociology and anthropology, Born sees music as immersed in different socialities, analyzing four orders of social mediation in music. Those are relations between collaborations of performers, imagined communities shared by these performances, identity categories of sonic practices, and social modes of production and distribution. This complex web of social modalities could be grasped through theories of mediations, one of them being actor network theory. I will focus on Benjamin Pickett's introduction of actor network theory in musicology. Pickett develops arguments for actor network theory implementation, especially in relation to historical musicology, as opposed to ethnomusicology, where its employment might be more obvious given to the common aspect of ethnography. On the other hand, Pickett draws many of his examples from experimental music, thus making them close to experimental radio art that is interesting to me. Finally, his study is detailed account on the ways in which actor network theory as a methodology of tracing actors and their associations could be used when trying to explain variety of music historical situations. The goal of introducing actor network theory is to provide, quote, empirically justified description of historical events, one that highlights the controversies, trials, and contingencies of truth, instead of reporting it as coherent, self-evident, and available for discovery, end of quote. While due to the limited time span of presentation, I could not provide more details on Pickett's essay, I will point that he emphasizes four methodological principles and three themes of interest to the history of music. Methodological principles are those of agency, action, ontology and performance, while three concerns of music historical interests are influence, genre and context. Trying to sum up main characteristics of this methodology, I would say that the goal of the researcher is to trace human and non-human actors that have agency, meaning those whose actions or circulation, if we are talking about object for example, or the way in which they interacted resulted in noticeable difference. What is actor is not decided in advance, but traced empirically through archive materials, historical facts, testimonials of the actors themselves and their narratives, material history, etc. Being focused on action means being focused on series of mediations and movements between actors as opposed to emphasis on fixed entities. Ontology in actor network theory is concerned with the ways in which networks of actors constitute reality with the main idea that Quote, being means being related in the world, end of quote. Finally, principle of performance takes into account those elements of music practice that are not reducible to discourses, but are nevertheless constitutive in the practice as a whole. 
Of the three music historical concerns that Pickett is listing, genre is at the moment of the most interest to my discussion. Genre is understood as, quote, unstable collection of related entities, end of quote. They are seen as fluid groupings and as, quote, assemblages that link together a variety of material, institutional, social, and symbolic resources, end of quote. They are comprised from human actors, technologies, architectures, but also of, quote, elements such as expectations, behaviors, and competences for listeners, or certain gestures and modes of bodily comportment that are readable for competent participants in a genre, end of quote. Having this fluid and hybrid reality of genre in sight, researchers drawing her methodology from actor network theory has more chances to grasp genre in its flux of associations and mediations instead as a stable, coherent entity given readily for interpretation when rallying on actor network theory's sensitivity to relations and microhistories. While approaching any musical assemblage would suggest tracing not only human actors, but also technologies, institutions, discourses and sonic practices, it seems that in the case of acoustic forms in the age of recordability, this approach is particularly potent because of the inherent complexities of webs that those practices are entangled with. Thus, my stance is that in approaching radio art as acoustic form, more detailed historical account on the emergence of such an experimental aesthetics would be provided if researcher focuses not only on the work as an entity, but instead traces associations between various actors, their dynamics, decisions that led to particular sonic results, technological frames in relation to which artists made creative choices, institutional politics, international festivals as gathering points of practitioners in the same field and their local radio stations. On the other hand, because of such a strong network of entanglements and consequently many layers of meaning that could be grasped from it, radio art is a rich field for transdisciplinary studies. As an illustration of the richness of those layers, I will quote 13 narratives included in the exhibition Radiophonic Spaces as one of the most expansive projects, to my present knowledge, in number of radio artworks gathered, but also artists' and researchers' perspectives on recurring questions, methods, themes and motives of radio art, to quote from an accompanying exhibition booklet. Those narratives refer to storage media, radio as medium of self-reflection, silence as key moment in radio broadcast, archives, composers' relations to ra radio, practices of remixes and remakes, thematization of subconsciousness, question in specific radio form, mobility of the radio, expansion of radio through spaces and places, integration of original sounds, radio plays as reaction to the many problems of humankind, and finally, to experimental broadcasting sound laboratories. Is it possible for a musicology researcher to grasp these layers from her own disciplinary point of reference? Here, Pickett's concluding remarks and introduction of the term historical ecologies proves inspirational. Ecology is understood as emergent hybrid grouping that connects many different kinds of things entangled in a web of relations and amalgamation of organic and inorganic, as well as biological and technological. Although music is not in the focus of this ecology, it is noted that music here returns as music itself, but with a twist, since its own agency is distinct, although entangled with other elements. That actor network theory, or theories of mediation, offer greater possibilities to understand emergence of experimental radio art, I am not suggesting that prior theoretical contributions were lacking in any sense. On the contrary, I would say that researcher working with actor network theory could build up on already existing theoretical work. On the slide, there is a list of musicological contributions, musicological in terms of being written by 
or supervised by musicologists or published in musicological publications. As noted at the beginning of this presentation, most of the papers suggest authors' concern for the particular radio art works, and in most cases, those are the works by composers, as opposed to works by authors coming from other arts or disciplines. There are two ways in which these prior contributions add to the knowledge necessary for further inquiries. First is that in some of cited papers, notably those by Kotevska and Chirich, there is already contribution in what we could, with knowing actor network theory, recognize as drawing the network of associations. In other words, researchers already found it necessary to list many of associations needed for emergence of radio art, yet focus was again shifted to particular works. However, in actor network theory, this knowledge accumulated from close readings of the chosen compositions could be used as music has its own agency and, quote, its power is inseparable from other agencies because it arrives in a tangle, end of quote. What is, then, the specific difference that actor network theory brings into existing body of knowledge rather than more detailed historical and social analysis? According to Pickett, it is more nuanced and fresh way to study groupings, the role of non-humans in creation of those groupings, and in determinate shapes emerging as a result. In other words, more layers are added to the analysis when distinct role of technologies and media as some forms of non-human actors is recognized, and with indeterminate shapes, there is more emphasis on empirical research as well as heightened awareness of what else could emerge as actor with agency in the research process. Since, as noted before, it is important not to determine actors in advance. This approach also proves sensitive to the perspectives of actors themselves and their own narratives. While I have mostly re referred to music in this section, following Pickett's account, I would stress that all that is said works with radio art and acoustic forms in general too, having in mind that in radio art music is one of recorded acoustic events, this entanglement becomes more complex. Thus, music in its traditional sense, as one of many acoustic elements used in compositions, and relations between those elements could be one point of interest. But even more so, acoustic forms that emerge as a result of media turn, which share the ontological quality of recordability, are in some ways more obviously immersed in webs of humans and non-humans, which in concrete examples shows other complexities of actors' relations. Thus, in many layers that radio art has, as mentioned in relation to radiophonic spaces, musicologists interested in acoustic forms after media turn could engage methodologists offered by actor network theory in order to grasp many of the associations and relations indicated by those layers. I found many of the benefits of this actor network theory's sensitivity to microhistories in my own research of emergence of radio art in Belgrade. Information gathered for the research comes from press clipping and other documents found in the Radio Belgrade archive, sleeves of the original tapes, programs of the festivals, scores, if existing, and other. Most importantly, it comes from the interviews with key actors on the topics related to their approach to radio art, processes of creating in specific conditions of studio and with collaborators on authorship and other. While archive research and interviews as material gathering methods are not new in musicology, I would suggest that focus shift from work to relations between actors and the idea of letting the actors present their narratives in more detail adds to the more accurate historical account. 
Relations between actors included various human actors, from authors, technicians, editors, performers, but also roles of the technology used and institutional frame in which those actors coexisted. In addition to actors I knew had agency in particular case, such as influential authors as Vladan Radovanovic, Arsenij Jovanovic and Ivan Stefanovic, initiator of the show Georgia Malavrazic, sound designer Zoran Jerkovic, to name the few, Neda De Polo and Pavle Stefanovic also proved to be significant actors who more or less directly influenced the intellectual atmosphere in which this experimental practice emerged, or their role was crucial in organizational matters. Similar was with the role of executives who did not engage in creative matters, but who had understanding to support creative endeavors. Also, certain fractions that actors reported in founding the show and later in collaborative work helped clarify the historical conditions without giving way to thinking about context in some abstract manner. Detailed interviews with actors about ways in which they approached technologies and collaborative practice served the same purpose. In regard to the question of genre, interviews, especially with the first editor of the show, Ivana Stefanovic, put some light on the ways in which other works, not only those produced in Radio Belgrade, were chosen for broadcasting and thus how the overall body of broadcasted works represented specific modernist aesthetics, although compositions and shows varied between themselves greatly. However, practice of doing interviews with actors also proved to be challenging in one particular sense that Pickett also mentions, and that is the prior context in which my research position was formed, and especially in regards to the type of information that I was set to gather. It demanded certain kind of flexibility to give precedence to the actor's own perspectives and the way this influenced the theoretical narrative. This was especially true when the idea of authorship was in question, since all of my informants were distinct author figures and this position was very important to them. Challenging theoretical approach is to find balance between what is true for actors and not to take anything of that position, while also putting those distinct positions into relations and understanding the type of the web where they all came together. On another hand, informants do not have all the particulars of the complete context in which their work was carried on, or better said, their insights are limited by their personal experiences or by their theoretical preferences. So this is the part filled with theoretical input from the researcher. Finding the right balance between respecting distinct actors' voices and researchers' own theoretical and empirical insight is the first challenge in this approach. The same is true for the relations between human and non-human actors. Since the discourse of non-human rule in creative and cultural practice only recently emerged as a theoretical idea, many of the actors simply didn't think of the technology in those terms and only after concrete questions did they provide narratives on this topic. However, this did not take anything from the narrative on this type of relations, but provided much needed actors' perspective on how exactly aware of and influenced by technology they were, account which keeps researchers from taking rushed observations. In taking Actor Network's approach to Radio Belgrade's experimental practice, the goal was to form the narrative that would explain the microhistory of radio art in Belgrade not only by taking the social and artistic context in the broad sense, but actual particular motivations and decisions of main actors, as well as material and technical conditions that led to the production as it is known today. I believe that fresh insights brought to historical musicology by actor network theory, as well as the attitude that all acoustic practices sharing the quality of recordability are in fact musicological field of interest, could provide us with more detailed narrative on specific music and media practice such as radio art, 
narrative that told testimonials of those who were actually practitioners of this art in high regard. This paper discusses the collaborative work for KKX developed between myself and Jonathan Packham, DPhil candidate and composer at the University of Oxford, exploring how virtual reality affords innovative approaches towards collaborating, composing, constructing identity, and using technology to remember and reinvent established musical repertoires in the 21st century. For KKX, for Serial Classical Guitar, Library Electronics and VR Headset School, was developed in late 2018 and premiered on Tuesday the 26th of February 2019 at the Jacqueline Dupre Music Building, St Hilda's College, University of Oxford. The piece explores the interface between physical and virtual realities in the context of guitar performance, principally through a semi-structured improvisational approach using instructional and notated material displayed in 3D space using the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset system. Fragments of material appear and disappear in a panoramic field around the performer, the guitarist, forcing embodied decision making and emphasising gestural content. The piece's live electronic component utilises the Constellation tracking system, transforming real-time positioning data using Max, MSP and Jitter into an ambient soundscape over which the performer can then improvise. Movement thus decides content, i.e. the fragment of material the performer is looking at, but also context, i.e. the process of reading the panoramic score affects the live electronic. So, when I have the headset on, you'll have to ignore the black, uh, the black lines, black boxes, and just pretend, pretend it's just a completely blank white canvas. This is what I will see in a 180 degree panorama. If I'm looking to the left, I will only be able to see what's on the left screen or on the left of my field of vision. And maybe in the corner of my eye, I can see what's in the center, but I definitely wouldn't be able to see what's on the right and vice versa. I, where I'm looking besides content. Obviously there's a mixture here of notated and gestural content. And as I'm scanning around the score and playing musical fragments, I am confronted with choices. Here at the moment we see three pieces of uh, material at the same time. I can choose which material to go to next, so there's a degree of indeterminacy in the score, and obviously therefore uh, the composition and the performance is crafted anew in every iteration of the performance of the piece. The composition was developed collaboratively through in-person and online composition and workshop with Packham later creating a 3D score and electronic patches in the studio. Here is a screenshot of one of our early conversations via Facebook Messenger. As you'll be able to see, this shines light on the nature of collaboration as an often very uh, low-key and organic process. The piece loosely borrows material from John Dowland's Frog Galliard, and the Aristophanic title is a nod to the subtle riveting in the live electronics part. We settled on Dowland's Frog Galliard because of my familiarity with the piece, its simple melody and structure, and its strong harmonic identity. Dowland is the earliest composer within my repertoire for solo classical guitar, whilst Prakakex is the most recently composed piece. So here is a recording of the opening of Dowland's Frog Galliard. So these early decisions regarding our choice of borrowed material from the Renaissance period raise many questions. Would this create a gulf in performance identity when paired with a 21st century technology would any elements of Renaissance performance practice influence the performance and would performative actions situated within 21st century approaches to music making 
assist in re-theorizing a remembered repertoire. Regardless, the use of borrowed material helped to ground an unfamiliar idiom in some familiar referential material. Dowland's material was present in two forms. Firstly, chords were taken and presented individually. These were chosen for their referential intensity, i.e. how frog galliardy they seemed, as well as their timbral and harmonic qualities within the sound world of the piece. It is worth noting these are distorted by the scordatura. You can see here at the, at the bottom of the screen the original material and then how those chords have been changed or taken, but then played uh, on the six strings of the guitar, which have been microtonally adjusted. And uh, so the bottom string, which would usually be a note of E, has been lowered a whole tone to a note of D, and most of the other strings have either been raised by a quarter tone or lowered by a quarter tone. The second referential form was far more explicit. Melodies were taken from the frog galliard and microtonally distorted. The effect of the electronics and the scordatura is quite obfuscating, but some familiarity remains in the physiological similarity of performing these new melodies, a kind of muscle memory. Again, we can see how the composer has changed this material, and we have palm muting and harmonics and another uh, performance, uh, compositional devices at play here. As explored, our compositional approach is reflected in an attempt to make my performance experience more comfortable. However, perhaps the most unfamiliar element of the piece is the use of the virtual reality headset score, an interface that very few other composers have experimented with since Packham began to produce them in January 2017. The 1990s saw the first widespread commercial releases of consumer headsets. In 1992, for instance, Computer Gaming World predicted affordable VR by 1994. Though, as we now realise, this did not manifest until much later, if at all. The use of the virtual reality headset is central to Packham's artistic practice, but in this instance also functions as a fulcrum around which the multiple identities, scholar, performer, composer, programmer, that we adopted throughout the project can be conceptualised and interrogated. Accordingly, we thought it would be useful to pair an unfamiliar interface, the Oculus Rift headset, with a very familiar one, the guitar. Thus we created a virtual guitar within the headset for me to engage within during the performance. Four virtual strings ascend in four directions, each side of the performer. The match, max patch tracks my velocity and uses it to play back recorded samples of my own guitar. Pitch down two octaves at various appropriate volumes. This creates a virtual guitar interface. See it at play here. Further explanation here, at the front we will see two sensors and these are tracking my headset. So when I do lean over to the right hand side, the screen that triggers one of these pre-recorded samples. Though playing the guitar with your head is not perhaps traditional, there is a physiological link between interaction with the instrument and interaction with the electronics in the notion of the pluck. And I hope that this creates a modicum of familiarity within a deeply unfamiliar environment. The performance of Brick is an exploration of the interface between physical and virtual realities. The piece develops Berkowitz's principles of virtual space and form and explores virtual environments as dynamic platforms for remembering and reinventing repertoires of the past. These innovative methods also present new challenges and performance for guitar performance. For example, Whilst wearing the headset, the guitarist is unable to see the fretboard. Thus, a process of shadowing along the neck of the guitar whilst counting is necessary in order to locate the necessary frets. 
In order to understand this piece as unfamiliar territory, it is useful to examine the repertoire that made up my live performances before this collaboration. Prior to the premiere on 26th of February 2019, only 4.3% of my repertoire used electronics, fixed or live, or other comparable technologies. Only 15.9% of the selected repertoire featured on my personal website was drawn from the 21st century. Accordingly, one might understand this collaboration as a widening of my generic experience and an evolution of my performance identity. Within the Western classical tradition, it has often been necessary for performers to cultivate individual styles which differentiate them from others, an invariable prerequisite for critical acclaim. For example, for Glenn Gould, it was his eccentricism, for Jacqueline Dupre, her on-stage extroversion, and for Dietrich fischer Descau, it was establishing a style of interpretation that focused on aligning the poetry to an extraordinary control of timbre, tone and colour. During the 20th century, the classical guitar world was polarised by two hugely influential and respected musicians whose performance styles were diametrically opposed, virtuosos John Williams and Julian Bream. Furthermore, as Minet Duantan Dac observes, more recently, the sustainability of the profession itself has become an issue of concern as audience numbers for classical music continue to shrink within an ever diversifying multiplicity of musical genres and practices. In no other period have musicians seeking to establish themselves face such a variety of challenges and pressures. Overcoming these will no doubt require new institutional, pedagogical, and even individual visions and approaches. I'm pretty sure this constitutes one of those individual visions and approaches here. Thus, my modus operandi before Brickerkex was to cultivate concert performances which conformed to many enduring customs of the Western classical tradition. The metaphorical comfort blanket of these customs was not totally present when collaborating at the premiere of this project. This is a direct result of musicians being willing to challenge their performance identities. In Brickerkex, technology functions as a fulcrum around which we can play composer, designer, improviser, programmer and researcher in myriad hybridised and simultaneous configurations. To borrow a phrase from Karen A. Frank, these identities are consistently recombined conceptually and exper uh, experientially. So they're on the left there. Conventions which I would conform to before, you know, dressing in black uh, and conservatively, uh, conservatively uh, during this festival. Those kind of divides were drawn down. You know, people were, and the audience members were encouraged to interact with some of the installations on the night of the premiere. Before I would commit pieces to memory, obviously that is impossible in this indeterminate piece. I usually also mediate my performances in real time with, due to the omnidirectional feedback loop between audience and performer, mostly in, in non-verbal ways, eye contact with the audience. If the audience are reacting in a certain way, that will obviously influence what I do, but I am unable to see, I'm unable to see them and they are unable to see my eyes at least. Often performances would end with a customary bow. In this performance it ended with a warm embrace. The full video of this premiere performance is available on YouTube. And whereas a usual performance climate would be of quite an intense focus, there is still quite an even more intense focus in this piece, but that is situated within a casual aesthetic. So research can be considered as a meeting point, a platform upon which to assimilate and perform a variety of previously distinct identities. On the day before the premiere, Packham and I organised a research workshop on virtual reality as part of the Expo 2 event. <clears throat> People from academic, artistic, compositional and performance backgrounds were all present, and participants worked collaboratively, exhibiting a blurring of identities. This event helped to illustrate the way that a research-focused event can in fact provide a platform for a variety of demographics. In the same way, our multi-rolling can be understood in terms of practice-based research. Our artistic practice as research takes in part after Anthony Britton's work, most significantly the notion that the relationship between practice and research, like our identity, cannot be predetermined but needs to emerge anew in each case. In his words, too closely and tightly determined a relationship between practice and research might not necessarily be conducive to create artistic work. 
We also take this approach to the adoption of clearly defined identities to compose a performer, programmer, researcher, instead suggesting that a more on-the-fly and flexible approach might be the most productive. In When I Enter Virtual Reality, What Body Will I Leave Behind? Karen A. Frank suggests that virtual worlds offer immense opportunities for testing and blurring boundaries. In an immediate sense, the virtual worlds, the headset, are malleable environments in which biological restrictions, creations, forms, memories, relationships, musicology, the laws of physics, and in the case of multi-user experiences, even codes of social conduct are subject to change. This pliable platform affords increased flexibility in both the user's identity and their sense of being in the real world. Here, virtual reality might offer space in which the clear, hard, harsh boundaries of the physical world can be tested and trialled in a safe environment. Participants might then consider transferring elements of the non-normativity present in the virtual space into the real world. Accordingly, this malleable virtual space is a good metaphor for understanding the flexible identity formations that come out of our collaboration. Rather than set up new or different boundaries, our understanding of the classical musician in the 21st century is couched in processes of connecting, encouraging, hybridising and merging, an endless array of possibilities to be imagined and created, rather than individual roles fenced off with terminology. Like Trump, we privilege the creation of ways of being and relating that are true alternatives to those current in the physical world and in our present culture. Specific elements of this collaboration also demonstrate the malleability of our identities, the openness and structural flexibility of the score, as well as the use of gestural and embodied decision-making processes within Prophetic X, afford the performer an authorial or compositional hand during the realisation of the piece that goes above and beyond the role of the performer of more traditional paper-based scores, allowing a reinvention of the original composition in real time. Similarly, the gestural nature of much of the material, as well as the virtual instrument, force the re-composer, Packham, to adopt the mindset of both the original composer and the contemporary performer, particularly the physicality of performance during the process of recreation. To what extent can Packham be regarded as the sole composer? To what extent can I be labelled as the piece's sole performer? <clears throat> It is important to not consider these roles as binary identities, but instead theorise them along a continuum. To pigeonhole Packham as a composer would play down the performative nature of the real-time electronics he controls during a performance of his piece. Lydia Gurr's argument that a musical work is not an object with a fixed definition, but rather a concept with both original and derivative uses, all of which are continually emerging, can be applied to our expanded identities within the conception, composition and performance of Brokhekhe. Virtual reality augments our agency and increases the ways in which a musical score may be remembered, re-theorised, recomposed and performed in the 21st century. <clears throat> so there are just some closing remarks here. I'd like to make the following statements. <clears throat> a performance of Prokekex is an exploration of the interface between physical and virtual realities. The piece develops Berkowitz's principles of virtual space and form and explores virtual environments as dynamic platforms for remembering and reinventing repertoires of the past. The appearance and disappearance of musical fragments in panoramic fields around performers forces embodied decision making and emphasises gestural content. Movement decides content, but also context. Virtual reality allows old repertoires to be reinvented and also offers a literal and metaphorical opportunity for musicians to transcend genre boundaries and enter ever-evolving contemporary performance context. Headsets function as fulcrums around which the multiple identities of composer, designer, historian, musicologist and performer can be interrogated in myriad hybridised and simultaneous configurations and consistently recombined conceptually and experientially. Finally, virtual worlds offer immense opportunities for testing and blurring boundaries. In an immense sense, in an immediate sense, the virtual worlds of the headset are malleable environments in which forms are not forgotten. Thank you for listening. I welcome any questions you may have.
Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk about one neglected, oddly sounding but nevertheless important musical field and hopefully you will find it interesting as much as I do. This is not glamorous nor romantic story about the glorious art and heroic triumph of the man's creativity or that deep philosophical analysis of gigantic scores. It is a rather fun and sketchy overview of how computer-produced blips and blobs opened the gates for the blossoming art of bedroom music composing that we are all witnessing these days. At the beginning, some brief remarks on the course of my presentation. Field of research will be music and first microcomputers. Terminology here is not clear, sometimes these were advertised as home, sometimes as personal, even portable computers, but all these had in common that they were made with microprocessors and sold as expandable units, so I will use the term home computer to distinguish them from PC, which is usually associated with modern computers. These examples are all from the second half of the 70s, so time borders for this paper will be from first published kits from the mid 70s to the mass marketing of complete and assembled home computers at the beginning of the 80s. These machines were used mostly by engineers, hobbyists, students, so music discussed here is a result of mainly amateur musical experiments with few exceptions. Three initial reasons were my main motivators for the research in this field. Reason 1. Numerous documents about experiments found in the collections and archives reveal a surprisingly close relationship between music and machine, generally considered not suitable for music, and in a way this was introduction of multimedia home computer idea, since basically these were small digital devices for playing and composing. Reason 2. From today's perspective, analysis of these experiments is a good opportunity to study basic concepts of computer music on the small, clear examples with no distractions from modern, endless possibilities. So, what makes this music special is the fact that it was made with something that was not designed to be appropriate mean for musical expression. Reason 3. These examples are showing that music was used as a tool for expressive computing. It was a demonstration with no other purpose but to show hackers' virtuosity. From late 60s, early 70s, computer world was dominated by mainframes, room-sized business machines made by IBM, DEC, Honeywell, etc. Computer music then was in simple terms almost exclusively institutional, made on time-shared university equipment, very advanced, involved in mathematical procedures, so complex, almost generally accepted as proper musical genre or subgenre of electroacoustic music. Mainframe computer was in a way modernist composer's dream, capable to execute author's commands from the audio level sample to the monumental scores written in high programming languages. Computer was considered a device that can synthesize unlimited variety of sounds, including human voice. Also, this was the time of the mini-computers and the first special musical computers that were even more potent than general-purpose machines. Nevertheless, these refrigerator-style machines were too big and expensive to be accessible to the masses and at the time they were known to very few experts from the field. Microcomputers are computers made around microprocessors. The first Intel's commercial microprocessor, 4004, was produced in 1971 and the most important one for this topic, 8080, was made available three years later. Microprocessors on a chip enabled drastic size and price reduction of computers, making them approachable by broad population. Academic and student communities were already familiar with mainframes and they were considered potential market for these small training devices. Main media for this market and community were specialized magazines where first computers and peripherals were advertised and presented together with build instructions. Microcomputers were more powerful than pocket calculators but less powerful than mainframes. 
The first wave of microcomputers in the mid 70s appeared as opportunity for pure computing. Since the devices were sold mainly as DIY kits, so the first goal for the user was to build proper working machine. These machines were Altair 8800, one of the first ever and very popular computer best known for boosting small software company called Microsoft. Salt 20, a rival party computer made as a smart terminal kit designed by Homebrew Computer Club, who was opposed to Bill Gates' software selling business model. MOS Technology Kim 1, MK14 and Cosmac will be discussed in more details later. Also, there were many others. Thanks to S100 expansion bus implemented in these devices, first home computers were like microprocessing seeds grown and developed depending on users' involvement. Having this in mind, seems that it was only logical that first applications aimed at testing equipment and its proper functioning. Primary tasks were of course executing instructions, calculations, shifting registers, read-write memories, etc. Applications where computers actually doing something were not so easy task, and dependent on which gadgets and additions user was equipped with and how skillful and imaginative she or he was. As it was mentioned earlier, musical applications were almost regular with these kits. Every machine offered some sort of amusing sound capabilities, more or less different in approach and result. This part of 70s computer music is generally associated with games. But this is not exactly true, since these machines were not capable of playing music during gameplay in usual sense of the word. Games in those times demanded a lot of players' imagination, since they were text or number based and terminal ASCII graphics was regarded luxurious. Nevertheless, musical applications were considered games and published in gaming books, so playing music is here used in a sense that computer music was something to play with rather than just to play as an instrument. Basically, there were three main approaches how microprocessors made music, the first two being directly inherited from mainframes. These are AM radio frequency synthesis, 4 loop or 1 bit TAC music made with switching one output pin from the microprocessor or by controlling external TTL devices with the same sound possibilities. These were simple logic chip circuits made to facilitate use of computer timers but resulting in similar characteristic square wave sound. And three, music synthesized directly by microprocessor and reproduced with usually 8-bit DAC or by controlling more complex external devices. AM frequency synthesis technique was originally invented by Peter Sampson at MIT with PDP series of mainframes mini computers and ported to Altair soon after its release. It uses computer as a radio frequency transmitter. One pin of the microprocessor is switched at radio broadcast frequency with one loop and with other two or more different audio range signals modulated with carrier frequency. Since there were a lot of wires in the computer, receiver were just put near the case and tuned to proper station. Using internal hardware to produce sound, switching output pin at audio rate with minimal sound card was enough for one of the first home computer sound cards named Software Technology Music System intended for use with S100 bus based systems such as Altair and Sol 20. It was a little bit more elaborate 1-bit DAC with accompanying software capable of playing 3-voice polyphony. On the other hand, solid-state music system for S100 computers was more elaborate and professional product made for direct sound synthesis with 8-bit DAC and wide range of sampling theorem-based possibilities.
6502 processor based DIY computer kit with very large user base, KIM 1 published in 1976. KIM stands for Keyboard Input Monitor. Although it was sold as a single board, it was usually expanded with terminal, tape and disc interfaces, printers, plotters, same as his more stylish predecessors. This was very bare bones, but easily adaptable kit, user friendly for the times because it enabled all kinds of applications, especially musical ones, both as controller and sound producing device with 1-bit or 8-bit DACs and numerous sound cards. Kim 1 was the first among this kind of computers adapted by professional composers. Jim Horton, John Bischoff and Tim Perkins from Mills College that found the League of Automatic Composers in 1978 used Kim for recording and performing music. Science of Cambridge MK14 was British rival to Kim 1 and as Kim very important as a starting point of British home computer industry. Designed by Chris Curry, future BBC Acorn founder and Clive Sinclair, hobby scene electronic wizard and future founder of ZX line of computers, it was based on less known INS8060 processor similarly designed as Kim single board intended for future modifications. Despite its limitations, MK14 from the beginning offered advanced musical possibilities with full DAC and few applications offered in a user manual such as music box, function generator and even organ meant to be played on a hexadecimal membrane keyboard. Editors of Creative Computing magazine made a kind of a retrospective as a part of Personal Computing 78 Fair at the Philadelphia Civic Center on August 25, 1978. All presented hackers, devices and compositions were iconic for the era and among the best regarding other endeavors and documentation about them. Vinyl record from the event was published by Creative Computing one year later and until today gained cult status among collectors as rare live recorded testimony of unique musical occasion. Concert was performance by 8 S100 based devices playing popular and classical tunes in order to demonstrate their versatility and sound qualities on familiar sounding examples. One curiosity was appearance of RCA Cosmac VIP gaming computer which had modular design with one of the first programmable sound generator based sound cards introducing early chip tune musical possibilities that will become standard equipment for home computers during 80s. Having in mind all these examples, one can easily get the idea how important this bad computer music was for early computing scene for numerous reasons. Among others, some of the most prominent ones from today's perspective are usage of computers for fun and in unusual way, at the same time point where microcomputer music development should go. Home computing kits were direct predecessor to chiptunes, trackers and MIDI music. It eventually gained mainstream musical scene in the late 80s, but with much more powerful machines. These experiments changed the idea of computer as business machine in corporate building full of large devices and people in black suits 
or academic device found in laboratories with people in white suits, to the perception of the small interesting box or board with blinking lights that can be used for fun and more important individual artistic expression. It looks like that music and abstract art and computing as abstract data processing went together through these pioneering times, gradually occupying human private sphere and free time besides already conquered business and educational usage. As we saw, whole scene of hackers turned into kitchen composers, making these musical boxes a proof of ingeniality and a huge step towards upcoming global computer revolution of the 80s.